Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, I am uh, greatly honored and feel privileged to introduce a person who does not need any introduction. Uh, you, you all know about this Professor Robert L. Thompson, who has dominated this uh, uh, thoughts of this agricultural economics worldwide. Uh, he was the uh, dean as well as professor of this uh, Pardu University for a long time. He was the dean from 1987 to 2000. Uh, 1987 to 1993 as dean, and he was professor uh, at various uh, successive uh, regime to from assistant professor to the professor from 1973 to 1974 to 1993 at the Pardo University. He studied at Cornell University, and uh, he has uh, been this uh, president also of this International Agricultural Economics Association. He has uh, he is. Uh, uh, is the fellow of this American Agricultural Economics Association, which AAE now has a new name, uh, which uh, most of our uh, are members of that association. And uh, he uh, had been also the president of this Windrock International, and currently he is the professor emeritus at this University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. So we know that as his global presence and the way. If we search in Google Scholar or this Google Thompson, it comes. When it comes to journal and other things, we know that one. The, throughout his life, he nurtured this policy uh, analysis. He has nurtured the students, young minds, and uh, that one. So we have this rare opportunity whom we have uh, heard about him, seen about his name and papers, unable to see him, and we thought that we would be lucky in life to see him. So this is uh, Professor Thompson here. So without much more introduction, because uh, his uh, work speaks so loudly, then I will never be able to introduce him properly. So I will request Professor Thompson to come and speak. Mm. So. Thank you, Professor Thompson. 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 Thank you, Professor after lunch today. The first time I visited Ikrasat was in 1977 or 78 uh, when uh, I was uh, part of the Insur Mill project or the International Sorghum and Millet uh, Consortium. I was the first uh, economist associated with that uh, project. It brought me to Ikrasat for a couple of days. But I'm no stranger to the CGIAR system. Uh, my uh, my first active involvement was uh, working in cooperation with the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines, uh, where uh, in 1968 to 70, I uh, worked in cooperation with them on doing farmer field demonstrations with the first two high yielding rice varieties, IR8 and IR5 in Laos. Uh, and uh, I've had a, an ex extensive contact with various centers over the years since then, but this is the First time I've been back to Simmet since that or first, first meeting. So, or sorry, to Ikrasat. So I'm really happy to uh, happy to be here and uh, and have a chance to meet with you today. I was asked to talk about the essential role uh, roles of uh, technology and international trade in future food security. And this afternoon, I'll start out uh, just briefly uh, reviewing the concepts of food security as I see it. Uh, uh, then I'll turn to some of the drivers of global demand for food, uh, followed by a discussion of agricultural supply potential, uh, international investment opportunities, and we'll wrap up with some comments on future prospects and why I believe that increased inv investment in agriculture research uh, and, and increasing freeing of international markets are both going to be essential uh, to ensuring future global food security. But uh, when I talk about food security, I usually differentiate three different types of food security. And the main focus today uh, will be glo global food security. And the basic question is, can the world's farmers produce enough more food uh, to feed the larger population better than today at reasonable cost without destroying the environment? Now, uh, I think it is important to differentiate, the uh, uh, to me mention the other two uh, ways in which I at least see food security. And the second, of course, is at the national level, because every government, of course, has to view food as strategically important to its survival, 
uh, it has to ensure there's a reliable, safe and nutritious, uh, reasonably priced supply of food available from some combination of domestic production and imports. And so the question really becomes, what's the potential in any given country for self-sufficiency that would be both economically efficient and environmentally sustainable? But then at the household level, uh, we're basically talking about the issue of hunger. And except in emergency situations, most hunger is caused by lack of purchasing power. The rich in no country go hungry except in times of war, natural disaster, politically imposed famine. So we really have the dual challenges of ensuring, uh, of raising productivity to ensure that there's enough food available, uh, but also the, the essential issue of reducing poverty. 70% of the extreme poverty, of course, is in rural areas. Uh, and so if we're going to solve the poverty problem and in turn the hunger problem, we have to do something about uh, increasing, uh, increasing the incomes of the lowest income members of society. Uh, it's that last topic I'll probably talk least about in my presentation today, but if you want to come back and discuss it in the q and I'll be glad to uh, address it at that point. So first, how big is this challenge that we're confronting? The new, the new projections just came out from the United Nations and the, uh, and the uh, Population Reference Bureau uh, with the latest, in, uh, latest uh, demographic projections out to the middle of the century. Uh, but uh, first looking, just going out to 2030, uh, we see that the current projection has an increase of a little over 1.1, almost 1.2 billion additional mouths to be fed. That's 16% increase in global population, but of course almost all of that is in the presently low-income countries uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, the developing countries, that set of countries that are undergoing uh, fairly rapid economic growth is about 766 million additional miles to be fed, and then in the least developed countries about 362. But now let's run it out to 2050 and focus on several, several numbers that I think uh, give us really, or should give us real pause. Uh, again, with the projected increase in global population of almost 2.5 billion additional miles to be fed, or growth of by 34% by mid-century, and again, virtually all of that growth in low-income countries. But I've, I've emphasized these two lines, South Central Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, as uh, for special attention. Uh, South Central Asia, of course, with additional. One more uh, line here is, is worthy of note. North Africa and West Asia have obviously much smaller population today than the other regions we've talked about, uh, but growing at a fairly rapid rate. And with the expectation of population growing by 63% by mid-century, or adding another 300 million additional miles to be fed by that, uh, by that time. Uh, of course, for you here in India, it's uh, no secret that uh, the population of India is expected to pass that of China by mid-century, uh, to exceed the population of China by about, uh, about 300 million people. Uh, Nigeria almost catches up with the United States in population, and of course we have Ethiopia and uh, Congo DR uh, moving on to the list of the 10 largest countries in the world. But these, these are some of the regions where the, the biggest challenges await us, um, but uh, there are two other factors, of course, as we're looking at the, de the growing demand for food. And one of these is, of course, urbanization and the effect it has on changing dietary patterns. Uh, we just passed the point a few years ago when half of the world's population for the first time lived in cities. The UN Population Office is now projecting this to go to 60% by 2030, almost 70% by 2050. A uh, huge challenge of how we're going to provision uh, these mega cities. And as we get uh, further into my presentation, uh, with this increasing urbanization, uh, we're also going to confront, I think, larger and larger problems of cities competing with farmers for available fresh water. But uh, population growth and urbanization alone uh, set the stage for the growth in uh, demand for food. But of course, it's purchasing power that translates uh, need into uh, real market demand. 
of the world's 7.3 billion people today, the most recent estimate by the World Bank was that 1.2 billion are still living on less than a dollar and a quarter a day. Last September's estimate by the World Food Program and FAO estimated that 780 million people, that's one out of every nine people in the world today, cannot afford even 1,800 calories per day. Not enough to put in a medium level of physical activity. Now, by $2 a day per capita income, most people can solve their, their hunger problems, they can get access to enough calories, but by no stretch of the, ima stretch of the imagination uh, will uh, they have adequate diets in terms of nutritionally balanced, the, the full range of essential amino acids, vitamins, and minerals. It's estimated that 2 billion people still suffer nutritional deficiencies. But then as, as people's incomes rise from 2 to about $10 per day, this is the range of income when you get the absolutely maximum rate of increase in demand for raw agricultural products. As people, for the first time, have the purchasing power to consume more meat, dairy products, eggs, edible oils, fruits, vegetables. Uh, but then when we get to about $10 per day, you've reached the point of satiation. Uh, you simply can't eat that much more physical volume. So beyond $10 a day, any, any increments to income that get spent on food tend to be spent on value-adding services after the raw product left the farm. Uh, things like convenience, packaging, processing, variety, luxury forms, but not more raw agricultural commodities. So we're in the situation that income growth is absolutely essential to reduce hunger, to uh, first allow everyone to be able to access enough calories, but then to the extent we're successful, we unleash the range of in income growth where we have the absolute maximum rate of increase in demand for raw agricultural products. So, uh, oops, we're going the wrong way. So uh, we, see the, uh, we see the rapid increase in demand for meat that's well known as, we go, as incomes rise. Uh, and uh, as we look at this chart, we see one of the reasons why demand for agricultural products, uh, agricultural commodities has expanded at such a rapid rate uh, in recent years. Uh, this, uh, this chart from the World Bank uh, uh, illustrates the number of uh, people living on uh, less than a dollar and a quarter a day from 1981 up to about 2010. And we see a very rapid drop off in the number of extreme poor. Uh, but with almost all of that reduction in China and to a lesser extent uh, in India with, with an actual increase in the number of, of uh, extremely low income people in very low income countries, the red blocks at the bottom, at the bottom of this chart. So to, to the extent, though, that we're successful at broad-based economic growth that continues to reduce the number of people living in this extreme poverty, uh, we will see acceleration of growth in demand for food. Uh, there are uh, lots of projections out there of the growth in the middle class. Um, this, one, uh, uh, this one suggests the middle class in developing countries is projected to grow by, 20, uh, by 92% by 2023. Uh, only 11% in developed countries. So we have uh, uh, likelihood of, the, of a very strong income effect reinforcing population growth and urbanization. That leads me to the conclusion that world demand for food is likely to grow by about two-thirds between now and 2050, with, with population growing a third from 7.3 to 9.7 billion, almost all in low-income countries, and a like 33% increase from broad-based economic growth and urbanization the, that leads to change in dietary patterns, putting greater pressure or increasing the resource needs for the, the mix of foods that people consume. But as the second bullet suggests, the biggest uh, risk to this uh, projection is how many hundreds of millions of presently low-income in people are successfully lifted out of their poverty uh, over these coming uh, 35, 35 years. But it's also relevant to emphasize that uh, there's significant growth in the bioeconomy going on. And we're not talking just about biofuels, but a wide range of, uh, of products that uh, biological production systems are being designed uh, to produce. 
And with the growing use of agricultural commodities as raw materials for the bioeconomy, uh, it's not uh, much of a stretch of the imagination to envision a world in which demand for grains and oil seeds could double between now and 2050. Now, uh, looking at uh, the or transitioning to the resource constraint, uh, uh, limiting this uh, or the potential increase in supply of food, uh, what I've done here is pop, uh, plotted the percentage distribution in world population on the right-hand uh, uh, chart and the percentage distribution of arable land in the left-hand chart. And uh, in the middle of, uh, of this ring, we have the percentage distribution of population in 2013. And in the outer ring, the projected, uh, uh, the projected size of the respective region's populations by mid-century. But the first thing I'd, I'd draw your attention to is the red wedges on the right, the orange wedges on the left. The red wedges are East Asia. Uh, the orange wedges are South Asia, and we see that today uh, we have more than twice as much of the world's population uh, living in, uh, in East and South Asia than we do uh, of the arable land. Uh, and uh, as, we, uh, as interestingly, as we uh, project out to 2050, we see that uh, uh, the, per, the fraction of the world's larger population uh, actually drops to 24 uh, percent as, uh, as we move out to 2050. But the biggest change uh, that you, you observe uh, in the percentage distribution of population is what happens in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is, this is the biggest question mark I have in all of this analysis. It's really who's going to feed sub-Saharan Africa with its uh, more than doubling of population. We see that today, Sub-Saharan Africa has an estimated 15% of the arable land uh, versus 13% of the population at the moment. But with that population jumping to 22% of the world's larger population in the future. So the biggest challenge to the global food system, I believe, is Sub-Saharan Africa. And I can construe scenarios that range all the way from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa being a massive importer of food on either concessional or commercial or some combination thereof, uh, or uh, being self-sufficient with, with the additional land that's available to be brought into production and the uh, relatively low crop yields uh, that still uh, prevail. But nevertheless, uh, that is one of the biggest uh, question marks, I believe, in all of this analysis. Now, the light blue wedges in the southwestern corners of these, this is Middle East and North Africa. Of course, it's not land that's the issue there, it's water. And as we saw on the population growth projections, uh, that region's population continues to grow rapidly as well. So uh, in percentage terms, there's likely to be a rapid increase in, uh, in demand for food in those regions. But uh, it's difficult for me to construe when we look at, construe a scenario, uh, when we look at these uh, di differences in the distribution of arable land and population, it's difficult for me to construe a scenario in these, uh, in these regions, particularly East Asia and Middle East and North Africa, where they aren't significantly larger uh, net importers of food. South Asia uh, remains a question mark in my mind. We can come back and talk about that if you wish to. But with this, so with the population growth, the urbanization, the broad-based economic development going on, I believe that uh, we'll see growth in a lot of low-income countries' food consumption, outstrip their production capacity, and no, more, no matter how much they invest in developing their agriculture, many of them will become larger net importers as demand outstrips supply potential on either commercial or concessional terms and that it's reasonable to expect a larger fraction of world agricultural production to need to move through international markets when we get to that point. Now turning to the global supply potential, uh, this map, okay. this map uh, based on uh, uh, satellite imagery uh, was developed at the University of Wisconsin at the Center for Sustainability 
in the global environment. Uh, but the way to interpret the map is the darker the shading, the higher, higher the percent of the land under that pixel, which is in crop production. And as we look across the northern hemisphere, we see a lot of dark shading with very little additional land that could be brought into production and uh, relatively lighter shading in South America and Sub-Saharan Africa. And of course, this turns out to be where most of the available additional uh, potentially arable land resides. Now, you find all kinds of estimates in the literature about how much more land could be brought into production worldwide. But as I, as I examine that, those range of estimates, I reach the conclusion that there's at most 12% more arable land available worldwide that's not presently forested or subject to erosion or desertification. And we know that there's significant loss of many soils occurring, uh, paving over prime agricultural land with urbanization, infrastructure construction, uh, nutrient mining, uh, pulling the nutrients out of the soil without replenishing them, erosion, desertification, and of course, there actually is some net increase uh, through reforestation in natural reserves. Now, the, it's pretty clear that the area of, of land in farm production worldwide could be doubled, but only at the cost of massive destruction of forest, and with that we'd lose wildlife habitat, lose biodiversity, lose carbon sequestration capacity, accelerating global warming, all unacceptable environmental outcomes. So I reached the inescapable conclusion that the only environmentally sustainable alternative is to do something close to doubling productivity on the fertile, non-erodible soils that are already in crop production around the world. And most of that available cropland that could be brought into production is in regions of South America and Sub-Saharan Africa where infrastructure is minimal and where soils are inferior in quality to many that are already in production. Um, this uh, highly aggregative map of uh, inherent land quality was developed by the Natural Resources Conservation Service at U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, but I like, to, uh, I like to pull this into the presentations uh, to emphasize that even though the land, much of that land that's available to be brought into production that's, that hasn't been uh, in annual crop production uh, is on less good soils, uh, there are good uh, precedents for uh, actually making them very productive. Uh, now, this, this map categorizes the world's soils on two criteria, soil performance, soil resilience. Uh, so inherent productivity, resilience, the, uh, the ability of that soil to be brought back uh, if it's, uh, if it's uh, degraded or uh, uh, resilience to erosion. But first, if we look at the green areas, the areas that are uh, the highest category on both criteria, the first thing that jumps out uh, at you as you look around the world is how relatively few of the areas uh, one finds of these uh, very best soils. You have the Pampa of Argentina, you've got the Black Soils region uh, that wraps around the northern part of the Black Sea, Ukraine and neighboring countries. You have the, the Corn Belt or Maize Belt in the, in the middle of the United States, and that's about it. But uh, when, you, uh, when you look at where these, uh, these uh, soils that might be brought into production reside, uh, they're red and brown. Well, when we look at the index over here, the red soils are the lowest in soil performance or inherent fertility, although they're the highest in soil resilience. The brown are medium on both criteria. Now, we lived in Brazil two years in 1972 and 73 uh, and drove out through this region uh, where the soybean expansion occurred over the last uh, several decades. And back at that time, this was area of twisted gnarled trees and bushes an occasional scrawny beef cow, and you couldn't have imagined that land in annual crop production. You drive through that same area today, it's, it's soybeans from one horizon to the other, with productivity not that much less than in uh, some of the best soils on the planet in the, uh, in the Corn Belt of the United States. And uh, what explains it? Basically, investments in agricultural research by Embrapa. 
first in tropical soils research to figure out how to manage a very difficult soil, soil with extremely low pH, massive capacity to tie up phosphate in an unavailable form, high aluminum content, so you had aluminum toxicity problems. But through tropical soils research, they figured out how to manage that soil and make it productive. Then, then came uh, breeding, applying classical plant breeding to breed the photoperiod sensitivity out of the soybean so you could move it closer to the equator. And with those, with those two developments, you basically turned the key that opened up the possibility of bringing that central west part of Brazil into, into soybean production at, uh, at quite a high uh, productivity level. Cost of production is higher because it takes more inputs, but it, that soil can be, made, uh, can be made highly productive. And, but if we look for the, what I see is the largest concentration of land, that, a potentially arable land that could be brought into production, we basically take that area where soybean production expanded in Brazil and slide straight east into the savanna zone, south and east of the rainforest in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, for, uh, limited roads, a lot of uh, a lot of things that need to need to be done to uh, uh, to make it attractive, to create the enabling environment for that land to be brought into production. Uh, but I would argue that there's one more Brazil left in the world cereals economy. And it is that uh, Guinea Savannah region of Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, if only if the infrastructure is put in place and the and other necessary components, the enabling environment, public policies, et cetera. Now, turning to uh, turning to the issue of climate change, should we have to overlay all of this uh, uh, this scenario with uh, the fact that uh, our agroecosystems are all shifting with climate change? Um, but uh, the one thing that I find you, you almost gets no mention in at least the popular literature about climate change is, is the fact or is the projection of temperature increase being greater over land than over water, and greatest at the high latitudes. That we have, uh, everybody talks about uh, limiting the increase in global average temperature to not more than two degrees Celsius. Well, two degrees Celsius over the, the global average, uh, by the time you get up into the Canadian prairies or, or Siberia, you're probably talking about at least eight degrees Celsius increase in temperature. So the cold constraint that limits the production of so many uh, crops uh, to, to below this uh, light blue region, uh, that margin is being pushed further north. In fact, uh, we're finding maize and soybeans that traditionally were grown here in the in the center part of the uh, of the Corn Belt, being pushed all the way to northern Minnesota, crossing the border into Canada, and for the first time, I in my not to my knowledge, a soybean crushing plant is being built on the Canadian side of the border. Uh, so basically, lengthening the growing season, ex increasing the increasing the potential for uh, uh, for crop production uh, that much further north. The, uh, but then the second important aspect of climate change, in my estimation, is the changing spatial distribution of precipitation, which I'll come back to in a second. Uh, but perhaps most important, the increased frequency of extreme climatic events, extreme flooding, extreme droughts, extreme tornadic activity, uh, extremes of all, all different, uh, extremely heavy uh, uh, monsoon uh, precipitation, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I, I won't dwell on this. This is just a map uh, out of the International Panel on, on, uh, on Climate Change uh, that uh, illustrating the projected greater increase in temperature at the high latitudes. But, I want, uh, but this uh, summary map on the long-term projected change in precipitation I think merits a couple of mentions. Uh, one of these is that uh, when we look at the high latitudes, we see a significant projected increase in winter precipitation, a modest increase in summer precipitation. Uh, so some places like the Canadian prairies that has pretty decent soil, but is really restricted to limited rainfall, um, I think might be one of the most uh, one of the greatest beneficiaries of climate change in all of world agriculture. Um, 
On the other hand, when we see the southwestern corner of the United States, which is in the middle of the greatest drought in 500 years, uh, the re as well as the region around the Mediterranean, uh, we see significant projected reduction in precipitation. So I, I just flag these two as examples that we're, we're expected to see some very significant changes in comparative advantage around the world, and with those, almost assuredly, with what gets shipped uh, to whom. So I see two forces driving an increased fraction of world agricultural production moving through international trade. One is the mismatch of where the, the, the land and water uh, or land and fresh water are relative to where the population uh, growth is going to be. And the second, uh, and the second is uh, the, the fact that all agroecosystems are shifting and that uh, uh, we will see some regions gain and others lose in, the, oops, in terms of their food production capacity. Uh, other agriculturally important effects of climate change, of course, greater carbon dioxide enhancing plant growth, at least of certain types of plants, a higher temperature extending the growing season we've seen, possibility of available water requiring increased demand for irrigation. Uh, I, I think we will live in a world of greater risk uh, from climatic variability and more frequent extreme events. The uh, risk management skills will become an even greater uh, uh, skill uh, for successful farmers, and it may, su it may suggest a, uh, a higher priority for things like crop insurance or, or farm revenue insurance as a form of public policy relative to the kind of support policies we've had in the past. Of course, with increasing temperature further north, we expect to see proliferation of pests and diseases further north when, the, when not having a severe uh, freeze in the winter time to kill them back. For sea level rise, reducing the area of cropland in some countries, uh, and possible of loss of soil fertility and increased erosion. But climate change is real. Adaptations are essential as all agroecosystems shift with climate change. And I would argue we're going to need larger investments, both public and private, in adaptive plant and animal breeding just to sustain present productivity levels as all ecosystems shift, uh, particularly important introducing more drought and heat tolerance. Some regions will certainly need to change the mix of what crops they're, they're growing as ecosystems slide three to four degrees latitude further north in the northern hemisphere and further south in the southern hemisphere. And again, as I suggest, I think we'll see a uh, need to rely more on international trade to balance the, the gains and losses from year to year with a greater frequency of extreme climatic events. I dwell a lot on land, but land, the land constraint may not even be the most significant constraint on future food production. Uh, it could very easily be the availability of fresh water. Because I think the most widely cited estimate is that farmers account for 70% of the world's fresh water use in their irrigation. But with the rapid urbanization going on, we're seeing increasing situations of cities outbidding agriculture for available fresh water. We've already seen in California, for example, uh, cities in Southern California buying farms in the Central Valley, stripping off the water rights, shipping the water south, and letting the farm go back to desert. Uh, because without irrigation water, you're, in, you're basically producing uh, in a desert there. So the world's farmers who are being called upon to do something likely approaching doubling food production in the next 35 years are probably going to have to do it using less total fresh water than they're using today. So we, whereas we may be talking about needing to do something close to doubling the average productivity of the land that's engaged in agricultural production, we may be talking about need to triple the crop per drop or the output uh, per unit of fresh water that we use. This is certainly going to re require investments in research to develop the water-saving technologies, uh, to further develop water-saving technologies, increase drought tolerance, increase water use efficiencies of the varieties being produced. Now, there is one source of optimism as I look at the world water situation. And that is, with water prices zero to most of the world's farmers, uh, it's basically the, 
pricing system is basically signaling that water is much more abundant than it is in reality. And of course, anything that's priced at zero is going to be wasted. There are a lot better technologies available today to increase water use efficiency than farmers are using in many parts of the world, but if water priced at zero, it simply doesn't pay to adopt them. Now, I don't underestimate the political difficulty of starting to charge for farmers for water in places where there's never been a tradition of paying anything for water, even worse if they get free electricity to pull it out of the ground with. But we're going to have to do something to provide farmers greater incentive to use the fresh water they use more efficiently um, and to uh, encourage them to adopt the already available technologies. Uh, it'll, t it'll take additional research, uh, but, it's, but we, could do, we could gain a lot just by using presently available technologies like drip irrigation, for example. So putting all this all together, sustainability is going to require greater food system productivity. Make presently unusable soils productive where possible. Uh, increase genetic potential of both individual crops as well as farming systems, farm animal species. Once you've got that genetic potential, improve the nutrition of the crop or the livestock species. Uh, increase water availability control. Reduce the competition from weeds for water, nutrients, and sunlight. Reduce losses from disease as well as insects. Uh, one, uh, I often debate issues of organic versus conventional agriculture uh, with uh, some of the ad advocates of organic agriculture. And uh, uh, I like to emphasize to them that every farming system, whether it were conventional, organic, or any other, these are the, these are the functions it has to perform. It has, you, you, you take as given the genetics that are embodied in the seed, uh, then you need to feed that crop optimally to achieve as much as you potentially can. And then you've got to minimize the, the detractors of the losses associated with weeds, disease, and insects. Uh, and uh, the result, of course, is the net harvest that you achieve, which obviously is always going to be less than the genetic potential, but you want it as close as possible. And, of course, we're increasingly concerned about reducing post-harvest losses with, uh, well, there, I don't think there are any really good estimates of uh, how of the quantity of post-harvest losses, the most widely used numbers are the, of something like a third being lost between the farmer's field and, uh, and retail or in the, and the consumer. Um, the, uh, with most of that loss being between retail and the consumer in the high-income countries, between the farmer's field and retail in low-income countries. But uh, in a resource-constrained world, one really has to question the morality of using so much land, water, energy, and fertilizer to produce so much food that never gets from farmer's fields to consumers. Now, uh, I don't for a minute uh, believe that uh, we can eliminate post-harvest losses. I think that would be achieved only at infinite cost. But if we, could, if we could cut a third down to a six, say cut it by half, that would be a good start on achieving that uh, increased availability of food that it's going to take to feed the world's larger population in the future. I like this, uh, this map that also came out of the, that same lab at the University of Wisconsin, the Center for Sustainability in the Global Environment, uh, where they have taken a sort of an average productivity of the three principal cereals grains of maize, wheat, and rice, and, uh, and using a, the color spectrum as uh, an indicator of from lowest to highest uh, yield being achieved, uh, have, uh, have plotted these on, on, a, on a global map. And I've, I think it's, uh, it's really insightful to, uh, uh, to see where the, where the highest yields are being achieved with the uh, U.S. Corn Belt, uh, Northern Europe, Northeastern China with the orange, the yellow regions around each of those uh, being the next highest yields. Then we, then we get down into the green area, which is really where the world average or the world mean uh, is. Uh, but then down into the, into the blue range, uh, where uh, we're talking about at most a fraction of uh, a quarter to maybe a quarter to at most a half 
of, uh, of the world average. So a lot of people say there's no way we could double the, the pro double productivity in agriculture. And my response is we're not talking about doubling productivity in every field regardless of whether they're some of the highest yielding uh, agricultures in the world. But if we look across, look across this world map and see the huge range uh, of, uh, of yields, and particularly how much of the world, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, is down here in the quarter to a half of the world average, you know, if, we, if we could bring yields in places like that up to the world average, it would be a heck of a good start. Uh, and so I'm not nearly as pessimistic about the possibility of doubling the average productivity of the soils in the world uh, when we when we take uh, when we ever when we recognize that we may be talking about tripling or quadrupling uh, productivity or more in uh, some regions like down here. Okay, uh, then uh, if we look at the uh, estimated yield gap. I like this bar chart that came out of the State of Food and Agriculture of 2012 uh, and juxtaposing it with this uh, yield map we just looked at. And of course their estimate, uh, their, the agronomist uh, who participated in that, uh, writing that chapter, uh, their estimate was that uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is achieving 25% of its potential yield uh, at, this, at this point. Now East Asia, their estimate was achieving 90% of, of potential yield. Uh, so probably relatively limited potential there. Uh, but uh, as, we, as we go back down through here, this further reinforces my sense that uh, we, we ought to be able to make some very significant increases in, uh, in uh, productivity uh, or in average productivity of the world's farming systems. So, the genetic potential embodied in the seed is certainly one of the first places that we can work, increase that. Uh, climatic conditions uh, we know are changing. Uh, quality of the soil, uh, we certainly need to focus on conservation. Uh, the, the soil surface in Sub-Saharan Africa is so heavily depleted of both organic matter and NP and K uh, that uh, there's a lot of investment needed in rebuild. Some some have even called it recapitalization of that soil soil resource to to increase the potential productivity there, uh, and uh, and we need certainly need to minimize the losses associated with uh, disease and insect infestations and so on, where where possible. Uh, there's irrigation potential that can be expanded, uh, a very very small fraction of the irrigation potential. Uh, of sub-Saharan Africa has been realized. I, as we drove around the farm here this afternoon, I was really impressed uh, with what you all have, have done in a semi-arid region in capturing as much of uh, the rainfall that's provided by nature as possible and uh, for, for later use. And consider a huge amount that could be done in sub-Saharan Africa in that area. Um, fertilizer use, uh, uh, this is the blue bars on this bar chart are the NP and K use in the, dec the first decade of this century. The brown or orange bar is in the, the decade of the 1960s. And uh, when we look across the various regions of the world, uh, we remember East Asia had, was achieving the highest fraction of potential yields in the, in the, in the yield gap analysis we looked at. And uh, not surprisingly, they're the heaviest supplier of fertilizer by a substantial margin. Here's South Asia. Uh, North America is over here with less NP and K used than South Asia. But look at Sub-Saharan Africa with the oldest, most degraded soil surface on the planet, used almost no fertilizer in 1960s and not using much of any today. So uh, as I approach the end of my presentation, we need to keep in mind, though, the other sources of observed differences in yields, existence of markets to supply farmers' inputs that embody the improved technologies as also a market for their outputs. Uh, to achieve this, we've got to have a business-friendly investment climate. We need remunerative input and output prices, uh, and we often underestimate 
the importance of investment in rural roads, of rural infrastructure, uh, to bring down the cost of inputs to, uh, uh, when by the time they get to farmers and actually increase the, uh, the value of the crop that farmers have produced by reducing the gap between farm price and urban price. And of course, education of farmers to in increase their knowledge and skills uh, can also make a huge difference. In a, we can't limit our analysis just to the crop sector, though. We need to increase the efficiency of livestock and poultry production, uh, particularly on improving feed conversion rates. Uh, we, we can work on genetics, but uh, there's a huge amount of 50 some year old animal nutrition principles that are not being applied to balancing rations. And as a result, by not putting enough protein with the energy in rations, we're seeing uh, far, far inferior conversion rates in, uh, in, in farm animal species, both poultry and, live, and livestock in many parts of the world. And uh, I also flagged the, the potential for reducing methane production per unit of milk and meat produced by ruminants. If we, can, if we double the productivity of a given animal, uh, then uh, we can uh, significantly reduce the amount of methane uh, uh, released per unit of milk or, or meat. Now, there remains a lot more productivity enhancement potential from classical plant and animal breeding, especially when combined with modern genomics. But uh, we have to also recognize that genetic engineering opens a lot of frontiers. If we can pack more nutritional content into a pound of, uh, of, a, of staple cereal grains, for example, if we can increase tolerance to drought, to wetness, to temperature, et cetera, et cetera, increase resistance to diseases, reduce pesticide use, uh, slow down product deter uh, deterioration, a lot of things that we can achieve if we're allowed to use all the tools of modern biology. I know that there's tremendous amount of debate about the acceptability of genetic engineering, uh, but uh, with the challenge that we confront of increasing food production by the amount that we're going to have to in the coming years, uh, I would argue that uh, we're going to need all the tools of modern biology at our disposal, particularly in coping with climate change as it's occurring. Uh, now, sadly, agriculture's been off the global ad development agenda for uh, most of the period since the mid-1980s, starting to edge its way back on. Uh, but the saddest thing of all, I think, is whereas not only the, the or, Whereas the fraction of foreign aid and development bank lending invested in agriculture development a drop, the fraction going to investment in agriculture research has dropped by an even larger percentage during, during this period. Uh, this chart from OECD's DAC, uh, the green line is the bilateral donors, uh, uh, foreign aid going to agriculture uh, and rural development. The yellow line is the World Bank and the regional development banks lending going to agriculture and rural development. And we see from the mid 80s, it just literally fell off a cliff, uh, almost disappearing in some case, situations. Uh, fortunately, with the price spike in 2008, we, we started to get the world's attention, bringing it back on. Uh, but I, I am still uh, fearful that we may not have uh, uh, the prices may not have stayed high enough long enough. We may not have had a long enough period of uh, showing starving kids on TV uh, news programs to really solidify that support for agriculture uh, as, as we need it to be. We know, all of us in this room know you can't turn the switch on and off in agriculture research. And if we're going to achieve the productivity gains in an era of climate change that it's going to take, we're going to have to have sustained commitment in agriculture research. So let me just wrap up with a few closing comments. So if the world's farmers are going to need to almost double agriculture production in the next 35 years using less water and a little more land than today, we've got a very significant challenge on our hands. But Malthus has been wrong for more than two centuries. 
uh, because he underestimated the power of research to increase productivity faster than demand for food grow has grown. Uh, and I would argue there's no more reason for him to be right in the 21st century than in the 19th or 20th. But he will only continue to be wrong if sufficient investments in agriculture research increase global agriculture productivity faster than demand grows. So whether world market prices trend upwards, downwards, or sideways in the 21st century will depend on whether agriculture research increases land and water productivity faster, slower, or at the same pace as world demand for food grows. The, and I argue the drop in public sector investments in agriculture development and agriculture research in particular have got to be reversed if, this, if there's to be any chance of avoiding an upward trend in prices. And of course, as we saw in 2008, when the price spike uh, uh, in, in basic commodities pushed uh, several uh, tens, of, uh, tens of millions of, pe of people uh, over the brink into a, a hungry situation since they couldn't, they couldn't af afford to buy even the minimum calories. Uh, we know how devastating an upward trend in the global commodity prices would be to low-income consumers who spend the largest fraction of their income on food. With that, let me stop here, and uh, sorry, I went a little longer than anticipated, but let me stop here and open up for questions and comments. But uh, this is what I spend a lot of my time do, talking to groups uh, uh, about, and uh, basically advocacy for why we've got to get agriculture research back and more firmly back onto the, uh, the global agenda. So open it up for questions or comments. Please. Doctor, uh, do you foresee a situation within our lifetime, and I'm not talking of 35 years or 20, 50 or those things, I'm talking this thing, that whatever money many countries are spending on military, country security, will also spend same amount of money in agricultural research and development. Do you foresee a, a situation like that in coming few years? No, uh, I don't think I th don't think there's any chance of that amount. But I, th I would hasten to add that it's very clear that the national defense community in many countries is increasingly recognizing the geopol the growing geopolitical importance of food security issues, and that uh, that uh, food insecurity can very easily lead to uh, political instability and uh, uh, you know even the even issues like the potential for cross-border conflicts over water uh, not to mention hungry people uh, in uh, in Europe right now we see the massive inflows of uh, refugees from from uh, from Syria and uh, you know if we got into a situation where you had large numbers of hungry people moving uh, for similar reasons we might start to get people's attention, but to to compete with military investments in military hardware, sadly, I don't think there's a, a prayer. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, like capitalism, 
Well, <clears throat> my point is that in technical terms, there's no reason that Africa shouldn't be able to feed Africa. That uh, it's there's no reason in, in technical terms, in my estimation, that if we could get the public policies right, the farmer education is center. You know, land tenure you cited, uh, particularly uh, for women who produce the, the majority of the foods produced in sub-Saharan Africa. The underinvestment in rural roads is probably the biggest single barrier to agriculture development in sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> you know, most of the developing world uh, world's public policies turned the terms of trade against their farmers through most of the post-colonial period up until the decade of the 90s. That's been, that's been fixed in South America. It's fi fixed in East and South Asia. But the one region of the world where public, the net effect of public policy is still to force their farmers to pay more than the world price for their inputs and get less than the world price for their outputs is sub-Saharan Africa. So there are a lot of public policy and legal issues, you know, rule of law, the ability to enforce contracts, uh, the list goes on and on of, of uh, strikes against the African farmer. But uh, the reality, uh, well, I guess what I'm trying to do is emphasize that the demand for food in sub-Saharan Africa is exploding and is, is going to explode at an even more rapid rate before along with the population growth, the urbanization, and, <clears throat> and the rising per capita incomes. Now, we've had more than 6% economic growth rates in almost, uh, almost two dozen countries going on for more than a decade. Uh, so there's the purchasing power is it making it possible for more and more sub-Saharan African residents who enter the middle class to upgrade their diet. I'm not saying it's easy, but there's no technical reason that it shouldn't be possible. Now, you mentioned the investments uh, in, uh, in farmland uh, by other countries. Uh, the first thing is that's prima facie evidence that they believe there's significant untapped agriculture production potential in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but I think it's important to, and, well, and Probably there are countries in the Middle East in particular that, uh, that see the potential for growing food in Africa and shipping it. But I spent quite a bit of time in Beijing uh, over the last several years. And, uh, you know, I'm convinced that from the agriculture development perspective, China's principal motivation is they want to see Africa feed Africa. They do not want Africa to be a huge net importer of food from the world market, bidding up the price of commodities in the world market that they would then have to pay, uh, say, to buy Brazilian soybeans or, or North American corn or wheat. Uh, <clears throat> they, uh, my sense is they have a pretty sophisticated understanding of the, uh, that the economics of producing food in Africa, shipping it all the way around Singapore and up the east coast of Asia, simply not very attractive, but they do not want Sub-Saharan Africa to be such a huge importer that they push up the global price of food to the point uh, that they have to pay a lot more for what they import. So, uh, but uh, I don't say it's easy, but we need to be doing much more, I think, to sensitize the world that that the, the food challenge in Africa is, is going to be, the, the, that the food challenge will be greatest in sub-Saharan Africa in the future. I think it will be great in South Asia, uh, but uh, relative terms, much worse in sub-Saharan Africa. Who else? National food security. I mean, mostly looked at as uh, food self-sufficiency, and I think at, based on that, I mean, to achieve these securities, you have mentioned several solutions uh, like you know increasing production, increasing productivity, and uh, also post-harvest orders. But uh, I don't know if I understood it right. You mentioned that uh, you're more, you were more sure about being uh, our capacity to double the productivity than uh, reducing the post-harvest losses, which is uh, yeah. closely linked. Or making food more uh, accessible to the households, you know, uh, uh, because India is a food self-sufficient country, yeah. but we are still we are still have a large number of uh, uh, 
demolished. So uh, where should the priorities lie? I mean, should the government be more, uh, uh, or should uh, the uh, spending be more on increasing productivity by pushing? Uh, of course, I mean, it is, I'm not denying that it is important where in the where uh, potential exists, yeah. but uh, we have uh, areas most of the green revolution tracks where the resources already constrained. Okay. So should the government mm -hmm. in India or countries like in situation like here should be more focusing on uh, on making food more accessible and reducing post harvest losses or again focus again on increasing productivity? Yeah. <clears throat> the well any government needs to focus on the dual objectives of raising pr agriculture productivity and reducing poverty. Increasing agriculture productivity can make uh, um, is, can make a beginning at reducing poverty in agriculture, uh, but no country in the world has solved the problem of rural poverty in agriculture alone. Every country that solved the problem of rural poverty has done it by by creating non-farm employment opportunities, both in faraway cities, but also in uh, in re in rural areas, and e and equipping the children growing up in that rural poverty with enough education and social and economic mobility so that they're actually able to move out of the poverty and literally so that both those who leave as well as those who stay behind have the potential for a higher income. Remember that most of the hunger in the world is associated with poverty. It's not lack of, lack of availability of food. It's the inability to access what's already available. And so you're not going to solve the hunger problem until you solve the poverty problem and you can't solve the poverty problem in agriculture alone. So uh, I would argue that India spends an awful lot on subsidizing fertilizer, underpricing water and electricity, um, uh, running a food distribution program uh, that, that uh, resources could be used much more efficiently of using targeted income transfers to both both low-income farmers as well as low-income consumers, uh, but at least as important, investing in rural infrastructure. The state of rural roads uh, is a huge impediment to both agricultural and non-farm investment in rural in rural areas. So uh, I think I would argue that uh, it's the uh, it's the it's the allocation of the uh, of the money that's being invested in agriculture in the food sector uh, in uh, relatively low rate of return activities, whereas uh, investments in uh, particularly rural roads and, and in agriculture research are vastly higher uh, rate of return in uh, public sector investments uh, than the subsidies the money's being spent on today. You get a lot bigger bang for your buck in, both in terms of of uh, reduced poverty and uh, more nu more nutritional gains uh, if uh, if there were some re reallocation of those resources in my estimation. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. Yes. Just many of these figures. Uh, and about a figure given by given by government of India. This many million people were brought out from the, 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 the lower line of poverty and in India it came that uh, uh, anyone who can spend 32 rupees a day is out from poverty line. Mm -hmm. And this to me sounds crazy in the sense that uh, honestly and politely speaking that even reduce the respect uh, of uh, to economists in my mind, a person who has spent uh, three and a three point four million rupees for a toilet renovation is that figure that anyone who can spend thirty two rupees is out from poverty line. How do you see such crazy things? Well, I don't. Uh, I don't have any direct knowledge of uh, of how India estimates the number of poor. Uh, I know. I believe the World Bank's estimate of the number of poor in India, based on the one dollar twenty-five or two dollar criteria, is higher than the government of India's. But I'm, 
uh, I don't know the specifics of that. I, I've, uh, I try to use the World Bank's estimates when I'm, when I'm working rather than individual countries that use a different measuring stack. Anybody else? Yeah. This, I'm not sure whether it is directly linked to this uh, presentation. However, I would like to seek your opinion on this aspect. You have mentioned that 70% of the world population by 2050 would be urban population, which means that another statistics which we frequently quote is that 70% of the freshwater available resources we are using for the agriculture. So increasing urbanization definitely means, as you mentioned, that the competition for the water resources in the agriculture sector itself, which means that we need to increase the productivity of water resources or probably irrigation technologies and all. So uh, how important it would be and what would be the future cause of that? In what direction? Uh, ah, you have mentioned that we need to increase agriculture productivity. In this, what would be the role of increasing productivity of irrigation technologies to what extent? Well, <clears throat> I think we need investment in uh, research in uh, increasing the the efficiency of irrigation technologies to the extent it's possible, but we'd make a bit, we'd make a good start if we had broader adoption of what's already available or the irrigation technologies that are already available. Uh, but I also but I also argue that uh, we're really going to need a lot more research on increasing the water use efficiency within the plant itself. And here we're talking about pretty basic biology. Uh, and that uh, uh, increasing drought tolerance, of course, is sort of the first the first step. Uh, at uh, at least if you can, if you've got a probability distribution of crop yields, and you can lob off the left hand tail of that distribution by increasing drought tolerance, uh, you can do do wonders to increasing the mean or the expected value if you can get rid of the left hand tail of the distribution. So. Um, I can't. I don't have an estimate of of what that research would cost, but it's. Uh, I think it's substantial, but it's probably going to be one of the highest payoff uh, areas of research in terms of dealing with climate change. Uh, but uh, if we could, if we had the incentive for farmers to adopt the already existing uh, water use or more water efficient uh, forms of irrigation, uh, it would. Uh, it would be a really good start for us. But I don't think enough people are paying attention to the to the fact that cities are going to outbid a bit more frequently outbid farmers for available fresh water. Okay, uh, maybe just one more uh, additional question to this. Uh, with respect to the irrigation technologies, where you place the role of solar technologies mm -hmm. in increasing the water productivity? The, the role of solar Solar, solar energy or solar are you, technology. Are you talking about increasing photosynthetic efficiency? Yeah. Oh, solar, solar, oh, solar power. powered yeah. uh, irrigation? Yeah. Uh, well, it all depends. Uh, if you're talking about solar powered pumps on tube wells, uh, we've already got problems of, uh, of overdrawing the aquifer and seeing the aquifers recede in a number of parts of the world. I guess in the Indo-Gangetic Plain, you're encountering some of that. We are in the United States in the Ogallala Aquifer in, say, western Nebraska and Kansas. Um, so uh, uh, solar powering of irrigation pumps can take some pressure off the grid. Uh, uh, but uh, the greater, the, I think the benefit is more to the electric power distribution system than it is to agriculture, especially, especially in places where uh, farmers are getting electricity off the grid for free. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Really appreciate that you have put a very strong argument to increase the investment in agriculture research. Regarding irrigation, we are seeing in India that the government of India as well as state government or even they are giving a subsidy on drip irrigation and sprinkler irrigation to the tune of 90 percent, 60 to 90 percent in fact all the state government and uh, uh, with the uh, support of central government 
they are giving subsidy. Still, the adoption of these micro irrigation technology is very less, less than 10 percent or 5 percent in few states. So, uh, where do you see that? Uh, uh, what is the problem mm. with the farmers in not adopting these technologies? There are some some kind of structural issues. Are there? Uh, I don't have intimate enough knowledge of Indian agriculture to even begin to hazard a guess on on why if you've got 60 to 80 percent subsidy to acquire the for the capital investment that farmers wouldn't avail themselves of it. But they're probably much more qualified people in this room than me to speculate on that. Can I'm sorry. I to those sure. Okay. Yes, 70 to 90 percent subsidy is given, right? I accept it in paper. Show me one farmer who will tell it publicly, yes, I got it. Show me one farmer. System is corrupt, farmers, no one gets it, number one. For your question, yes, with the NICRSAT we are using, ABRDC is using drip irrigation, it saves 60 percent water, that's a fact. They have put a solar pump, solar uh, system, yes, a research institute can afford it, farmers cannot afford it, it's expensive at the moment. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, thanks very much for having me today.